Here we have a continuation of the AutoIgnite uh, testing or experiment or whatever you want to call it. Um, but I'm also going to turn this into a thermal plant. So inside here, we have a variation of my infinite uh, uh, block storage um, build, all connected into these pipes that are over here. And they're all inside walls because they need to be invincible. Um, we have a uh, air conditioner over here to heat this uh, this section of the pipe up to cause a, an auto ignition. Uh, we have a digital valve here connected to this switch to turn it on and off. A um, pipe analyzer right here to um, to show what the uh, inside value is of these pipes and I've missed a segment here. Oops. Just quickly connect this up. Is that the right pipe? That's the right pipe. Okay. And then it all goes over here uh, into this exchanger. So this side of the pipe is um, separate from from this side and uh, uh, so it won't blow up uh, we have a vent over here so that we can uh, evacuate the the block but typically you just uh, deconstruct one of these um, one of these segments and it'll just blow out um, and then this pump is to uh, get rid of everything that's not uh, polluted atmosphere, whatever they want to call it, from uh, this segment here. So this will be priming this segment with polluted um, atmosphere. And then this is just to grab it from um, whatever this plant is called, but it's not very good. It doesn't, uh, it takes a really long time to pull atmosphere from the atmosphere. I'm, I keep saying the same word over and over again. It's kind of stupid, but whatever. So we'll close this up. Now, to get at those valves, even though they're behind a wall, you can kind of do this, and then you can you can get a uh, get a hold of them. But we're not going to change them because we're they're set to what we want them to be. And we're going to grab. Uh, first, we're going to purge. We're going to purge the system off. There. Now we can purge the entire thing out, the uh, the whole inside, but it would take a lot of energy. Actually, we might do that because um, it just means that it'll take less energy to uh, to ignite, and uh, we'll need less fuel to ignite and keep the inside all nice and, uh, and hard and hot. And I've gotten bored in patience, so we're going to screw it. Yeah, so now we just go on and stick these on here. There. So now we're just going to let a tiny bit of uh, gas into the pipe. Not a whole lot. Turn this on. Which is not working for some reason. Oh, because of front push start. Ah, shit. Yeah, I forgot. I have to... I have to preheat one of them first instead of preheating them both at the same instead of heating them both at the same time because it pops if I do that. But you can um, you can avoid it popping just by uh, just by preheating one of the two. Now. It will run both. 
Now what we're looking for here is to just raise the pressure and the temperature up so that uh, we'll have a lot of hot gas when we fill the, uh, the block storage up. Because the block storage already has um, gas in it that's not very warm. So I'm going to shut it off at 50, um, just because I want to, to play like it's not actually indestructible what it is. Let me open it up, and that will drop, or oh, that'll cause the value to be kind of uh, winky-wonky for a while. There. So we've stabilized at uh, 300 degrees Celsius. So what we will do is that we will stick our head in here. Can we stick it in here? Well, we can change that simply by um, putting uh, logic uh, gates in there. Which we might have to do because I think I have blocked... Yeah, I have blocked my ability to get in there. I have locked out my ability to get in there. Oh, there we go. I can just get it, maybe. Nope. I can't get it. So, I don't really want to build a, a logic thing, but let's build a logic thing. I am exceptionally well prepared. Okay. So now let's pump this up to... Oh, God, I can't use... This is going to take a... This is going to take a while. Now, we should hear the difference. Is this on or off? Oops, I forgot to connect that part up. Okay, so now we'll empty out the tanks into the block storage. There we go. Get rid of these. Because they are not needed anymore. And we could feed the system back with anything, because there's going to be a lot of carbon, ox carbon dioxide in there. So now, how much is in here? Oh, quite a lot already. from the last test, probably. And we'll turn him on. And then we'll turn this on. And this is not functioning properly. Internal pressure differential. Hmm. I did something wrong here. Oh, 17 kilopascals, that's it? Okay. So, uh, we still have a long way to go. So we'll switch this pipe on, for this pump on first, and then we'll turn this on. And that should increase how much uh, pressure is in the pipe. Yep. 
And our Sterling engine is starting to work. Now we need a differential between the, uh, the internal working um, fluid, which isn't being, or not fluid, at, uh, gas, to the external, but um, it doesn't actually show what the internal pressure is. I'm pretty sure it's about 4 megapascals. But uh, we'll raise this up to 10. Oh, we got a little bit of power generation. And if we go over here, we can see what the temperature is in that segment, and it's going down just a little bit. We we'll probably want another uh, monitor in here, but... Oh, it's now generating enough to keep the battery... Oh, no, it's not. Now I'm going to prime this pump over here because eventually I want to take this gas and put it in another Stirling engine, so we have two. But one should be enough to operate most of the equipment. Now there is a little trick to get um, what the uh, the contents of the pipe are. We can just stick our head through the wall here. So it is mostly there's a lot of there's a lot of oxygen in there. It's mostly carbon dioxide with a little bit of of uh, of polluted oxygen or polluted atmosphere, pollutants, whatever you want to call it. And we can easily collect crushed ice and stuff and just shove it into the into the block. Now, we can't actually have a chute do it because the end of the chute will rot off. It'll, it'll burn up in the hot gas, and it won't be usable. So instead of just going around collecting um, volatile ice, let's just make another uh, volatile tank, just so we can skip through this, because mining is the least fun part of this game. We'll put you down here. We'll tie you down. And then we will turn this on and send it back in there. And it will auto combust. Of course, if we're using ice, the temperature will be slightly lower, but it, uh, it really won't matter. If you want, you can also preload the block with um, oxalite and volatile ice and just pump in a little bit of, uh, of combusted gas and it will ignite big time. There we go. Back up to one millipascal, and that's one millipascal pretty much per square. So there's nine squares inside. Um, so you have uh, however much it is per, per mole, per square per mole. Kind of get a hint here. So we have about one kilomole. Oh, we still have a lot of oxygen. We have about one kilomole of carbon dioxide 
times 9. Um, now that's that's not um, a great that's not a really accurate measurement because we're talking about one um, one pipe segment there. Oh, and this thing is powered up all the way, so now it's it's working um, completely and properly. And there's the pressure differential. Now we could probably increase the efficiency by enclosing the uh, the Stirling engine and just pushing through as much uh, air as possible. But we're already at 16 kilopascals outside at 2 degrees, so um, that's fine. This is the alien planet, or whatever they call it. And we're just waiting for uh, this tank to go up to the proper pressure so we can add another Stirling engine. But we don't really need to, because um, I think at maximum we can generate four um, kilowatts. Yeah, we're already at 3.6 kilowatts. And I don't think it's going up too much. The different working fluids, the diff different gases, working different ga the different working gases uh, are supposed to give you a different efficiency. Like the working gas efficiency is five percent. That might be higher with hydrogen. I'm not hundred percent certain. Uh, the wiki is not super accurate. I believe the working fl a working gas in a real Stirling engine. I think heavier is better, or it might be lighter. I'm not. I'm not exactly sure because it pushes a piston up and down. This is not exactly the way it looks, but it's it's basically like a um, one piston in the center with like a, an array of tubes around the outside that allows gas to flow from one side to the other. And then there's little valves in there, and as one side gets hot, it pushes. Uh, the piston downwards, and then once it reaches the bottom, the valves change, and then the pistons push it in the opposite direction. Um, and there is practical use for it. There's a Swedish submarine that uses a Stirling engine uh, in combination with burning diesel flu uh, fuel to heat up the Stirling engine and uh, move the piston. And because the piston moves quite slowly. It moves much slower than this, but it has a lot of um, a lot of uh, not velocity, but a lot of momentum behind it. Like it's not, it doesn't it doesn't have velocity, but it has momentum. It's difficult to stop it. It can push against an electromagnetic field or, an, or against a magnetic field to generate um, AC current, which is then uh, used to power the submarine. And then, of course, the cold side is just the ocean. So you have, um, I think diesel burns at 600 degrees Celsius or something, something like that, or 500 or 400, something like that. I'm not, I'm not sure. I would need to have references in front of me to know what it is. But um, you have that compared to, like, between 0 and 10 degrees deep down in the ocean, and you would have a lot of, uh, differential. Now, Stirling engine has much, much higher um, efficiency than a thermal electric uh, generator. So, a thermal electric, it's it's basically a tech. So, it, it's it's like a it's like a Pelche, okay, like a Pelche cooler. So, one side gets hot, one side gets cold. But they have very low efficiency when you have a big thermal difference. Um, even when generating electricity. So if one side you have 100 degrees and the other side you have zero degrees, the efficiency coefficient will go way down, um, but you'll be generating more energy. But if you have a difference of like one degree, the efficiency is very high, but you'll have very little electricity coming out of there. You'll only have like um, nanowatts coming out, but it's highly, highly efficient. 
and that's part of the reason why they're used in space so much because you don't need a lot of electricity in space like it seems kind of counterproductive but when you have these probes that go excuse me that go millions of miles away they're built to um to use only a couple hundred watts at maximum. So they have the RTGs working uh not R well they they do have an RTG, like the Voyager had an RTG, but they have these um uh thermoelectric generators um at very uh, at very low differentials to charge the their batteries so that they don't need a big radioactive source on them. They could have a weak radioactive source that's only like, you know, 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 degrees Celsius, because that's all you need. Space is, you know, pretty close to absolute zero. So as long as you're generating, um, as long as you're generating enough heat to be, you know, slightly above absolute zero, the uh, thermoelectric generators will operate and very well. Um, Voyager, both Voyagers, I think, still transmitting. We we went out of contact with one of the Voyagers, but it was reestablished like this year or last year or something, which is great. One of the only reasons that we stopped using um, um, radio thermo, uh, thermoelectric generators is because of the risk of it falling back to Earth when it was, you know, lifted off into space. Which is which is very minor. So we have about 0 0.1 degrees per second, 0 0.2 degrees per second. So we have, you know, uh, 10,000 seconds worth of energy out of just, you know, um, two bottles of hydrogen and one bottle of oxygen. And with all the carbon dioxide we have in there, we can very easily... Uh, we can very easily convert that into oxygen, the carbon dioxide, um, and feed it back into the system to be oxygen. Hydrogen is um, another story. I'm not exactly sure how to generate hydrogen in this game. I, I think we can create water from a lot of plants, from a few of the plants, and with that water... Uh, we can split it into hydrogen and oxygen. Like, I'm sure if I find some water here... Ooh, there's some water ice right there. Or this could be... Yeah, this could be um, oxalite. But we can just put the uh, the water through uh, an electrolyzer, and then we'll have, flu we'll have fuel for this thing. Now, you can shrink this down to just one square. And I was originally using one square, but... I was kind of concerned that maybe um, some gases were getting deleted because it was so it was so enclosed. Plus, the working pressure was so much higher when it was enclosed. The working pressure was, you know, uh, it was more than nine times. It was a it was an exponent, and um, it was like around a um, hundred megapascals or something. So now we're back down to one megapascal. Future me interrupting myself here. I had a few more tests on this video that were just repeats or didn't matter or didn't work out. Uh, but I've already shown the basics of this test and how to get a large uh, store of thermal energy. I have another test that I already done that will fail on the uh, thermal warming planet um, that I'll put together and uh, publish soon. But... I guess that'll be about it for this video. Um, the rest of the stuff didn't matter, and I'm just gonna gonna ditch that footage.